at least what would you like to see us cover next step? Because y'all drive the topics. We have one more yes. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Terry Moore and I am one of many um, and mighty on the leadership team for the Decatur Parents Network. Um, who else is on the leadership team? Peter Blishko. Stacey Stevens. Uh, Stacey Stevens. Stacey Stevens. Stacey and we have several folks who weren't able to be here with us this evening as well. Um, Kate Donovan's also on our leadership team. Eric Tumpery is on there as well as Jen Walcott. Am I missing anybody? Probably. Probably. <laughs> um, how many of y'all have been to one of our speaker series events before? So, oh good, we have some new folks too. This is good. The Decatur Parents Network got started almost four years ago now um, in reaction to some things that were happening in the community that just raised concern among parents. And over the last four years, we have um, hosted numerous parent events and have worked with a lot of parents. We have about 435, I think I checked this week, 435 of you have actually signed the pledge and are on our <coughs> list, sir. Um, another 300 plus or 300-ish are uh, friends which means you still get a lot of the mailings and stuff too to get informed on when things are going. Um, our main goal with the Parent Network is to get parents together and talking and to have you be able to support each other when you meet life's challenges. Um, and some of you with the younger kids, we've really been focusing on trying to get some of you guys here because a lot of folks have said, boy, I wish I had known this when my kids were younger. Why didn't I know this when? So this year we've made a real concerted effort trying to get it down into the tally um, fave group as well as the high school and the middle school. But before you leave, please do a survey because if there's a topic you would like to see us address or you don't like the way we've handled something, please let us know. Um, if you have friends who could not be here tonight because of other commitments or because it was Ash Wednesday and I didn't realize it, um, it will be videoed as Marnie is videoing and people are welcome to, uh, it'll probably be uploaded within the next couple of days and uh, Joel Gould is another one of our volunteers, Joel will upload it and make sure all the handouts and everything are there. So, um, before we get started we wanted you to see a little movie. That Susan came up with. So, can we dim the lights, please? Let's make sure that everything is going This one turns it off. It just takes a few minutes to get back on. It, it? it will be turned okay. off. Yeah. Because we're trying to make all of the technology work together. <clears throat> Some of you who don't know me uh, may not realize that technology is not always my friend. <laughs> uh, I try. Why don't I have a penis? Can you get pregnant the first time you have sex? <laughs> Why get boobs? enter the caput epididymis, progresses to the corpus, and finally reaches the cauda region, where they are stored. Huh? 
I don't even know if you're gay. You're gay? Michelle kissed me at recess. She did what? When does my penis stand up? Ask your mother. Ask your father. Ask her again. How would I know? I don't have a penis. What's a period? A type of punctuation. You need to pay better attention in English class. Can you get pregnant the first time you have sex? Not if you don't have it, which you never will. Can I get birth control? No. No. Nope. No. No, 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 no. Did you have sex at my age? Uh... Um, 
that include all of the work in the department. So um, when I started three years ago, I was hired as the equity director and really focused on racial equity, um, Title VI, Title IX, um, and just really anything related to equity across the district. And then uh, about a year and a half ago, my role expanded to include student support. And I think it has really been um, a wonderful experience to be able to infuse equity into all of these areas that you see listed here. So from the Decatur Student Center work, which is largely focused on wraparound services and um, mental health support, uh, really being able to infuse the equity lens with that work, as well as school counseling, school social work, school nursing, and school psychology. So we're very busy in equity and student support, and we have a wonderful team, one of whom you'll hear from in just a few minutes. So just to briefly talk about what you can expect your children to be involved with related to sex education in the district, um, typically around fifth grade, um, there is a talk with students around their changing bodies and typically our school nurses are very much involved in planning and guiding that. Um, so that happens at fifth grade. And then for those of you who have middle school students, you're aware that they take um, personal health and fitness and we follow, we're guided by the, the Georgia standards and really following um, guidance there in terms of health. And those are the primary areas, although um, you'll hear a little bit more about some offerings that they may um, be involved in with, through counseling and other areas in, um, in our department. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the panel so that you can have time to learn from our experts as well as to leave some time for questions. If anyone came in a little later and didn't have an opportunity to uh, give a question for later, please feel free to bring those up to the basket, and we can also be more informal in your region. Or if you just have all the questions, questions. Come get them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are ready to move. Uh, my name is Susan Doyle. I am not a Decatur parent, but I am a Decatur grandparent. Um, I uh, have been a nurse midwife for almost 30 years, and I'm just about to retire uh, in the middle of March. And so I, I have been involved with sexual health my whole career, working with teenagers, working with women, working with couples. Uh, but I got even more passionate about it in the last few years and um, did a, a certificate program at the University of Michigan in sexual health. And went ahead and got my certification as a sexuality counselor. Uh, I did sex counseling and sex education at the University of Michigan, but I got certified as a sexuality counselor uh, in back at the end of October. So um, I'm moving in a new direction. I'm passionate about sexual health. Um, one thing I can say, and I, I had a, uh, my children went to Druid Hills, um, and so I know a little bit about what they're not getting. Um, and the fact of the matter is uh, that we adults need to do a better job preparing our kids to have healthy sex lives. So, and I don't, I mean as adults. So, the schools are not doing it. The school, you know, and, and the abstinence only education that's been pretty much the, um, the uh, routine in schools is not, is not a, enough to give kids the information they need to make good decisions. That's my, my plug. <laughs> hey, before, but that was me. Oh, that's not that's me. Not like that's not you. But that is you. Okay, right, you go on to the next one. So I'm um, Ken Jackson. I'm a counselor at the high school. I have also um, been a counselor. I tell students a really, really long time. We'll say since the late 80s, but we'll let it go with that. Um, I have a lot of other letters, um, licensed professional, professional counselor, supervisor, and those kinds of things. But I've had a bunch of wonderful opportunities to listen to parents and your students ask their questions. Um, my first scary counseling moment, brand new counselor with my master's degree, all shiny, and a student wanted to talk about, mom wanted to be about math, and right before the mother walked in, the, she says, I'm pregnant, don't tell my mom. Um, <laughs> 
being the new professional counselor that I was, and by the command, the first thing she said, she goes, so is she pregnant? I didn't know any of this going on. So I did my most mature thing. I said, I am so sorry. I should have done this before, but I've got to go to the bathroom. And I walked up to left. Okay? I went by my supervisor and went, and then was guided through it. So you can probably do nothing worse than I've done is you have these conversations. You can always say, I've got to go to the bathroom and run and hide, and then come back and, and try again. In my conversations with families, and I just put a few, you can't read any of those, I don't think so. You just have to guess what I said. Um, and we'll share those with you later, I'm sure. Yes, these will be the, uploaded as well. Okay. The first is the what and why. And to sort of figure out as a family what you want your child to know. And then, even more important, what you want your child to do. But here's where I found some will leave, leave out. It's the why. So there's a parent um, connected with the network who's giving permission to share this wonderful story. Um, her son came to her, late middle school, and basically asked that question, you know, what is a period? And she said, I waxed philosophically about moon changes and everything else. And he walked away knowing that if you have your period, you're pregnant. So he said, I totally screwed that up. I had to come back and revisit and come back and say again. My daughter got to high school, and I did it differently. I wrote her a letter. And the letter said, this is what we believe as a family. This is the why we believe it. Um, this is, bottom line, when you get into trouble, this is what I expect with um, protection and everything else, but you can always come to me. And I know she may have read or not, but every time after that, when I wanted to talk with her, I could refer to that letter, because I got it right at least once. <laughs> and so I could come back and refer to that. The second, I would say, is um, some of the legal aspects. I find out that at least in high school, they have totally, totally been oblivious of knowing. Um, if I'm a 16-year-old and I have sex with my 15-year-old boyfriend or girlfriend, is that legal or not legal? Okay, it's a misdemeanor. Just so you know, may or may not be tried, but that's what it is. If I'm 16 and have sex with an 18-year-old, that's legal. And so some of these legal things, but I've also had some most interesting discussions, and they typically are with our males about what is consent mm -hmm. and the difference between encouragement, hey, would you like to, persuasion between we've known each other for two years, why don't we, then coercion. And there's no such thing as consent below the age of 16 when someone is drinking. And what does that mean? And what will the person think the next day, because our society has taught us to feel guilty, and so therefore, the next day, will the person look back on consent differently? And if you thought about this, and we know you have it, because your brain's not developed till you're 25, and you can't even think about Friday on Monday. We know that. Okay, come to our brain lecture for DHS 101, and we talk about that. But I think those are some of the conversations to have. And then finally, what I tell folks is, um, parents, is build relationship capital. Every time you show up to a basketball game or a play or this meeting there, they notice. Every time you ride in the car and you have a conversation and you listen, they notice. And that matters when it's time to have the serious conversations because you built up that. And finally, I would say, be very comfortable. It's okay to be embarrassed because they are. And it's okay to say, no, that's sort of an embarrassing question. You know, we didn't ask that in my day. Let's talk about it and to get it on the open and it's all right. Um, hi, I'm Nabob McDaniels, and my training uh, way back when I graduated from the Emory School of Public Health. Um, I'm technically a community health educator, and um, I sort of fell into sex ed. Um, I had an interest in pregnancy prevention, and my first job out of graduate school was at a high school in Independence, Missouri. Um, I moved there, my husband, I got married, and my husband was living there and working there, and so that's where I went. And um, it was a very, I'd say, working class, working poor um, high school. Um, and I had a lot of good experiences, there a lot of formative experiences, but they put me in with the teen moms. And so when I ended up with the teen moms, um, I learned a lot about teenagers, we talked a lot about relationships, we talked about sex, lack of sex, taking care of your baby, you know, all of those kind of things. Um, and so consequently, I became comfortable having these conversations. And I think I was pretty close to their age. I was about 24, but I looked like I was 16. So I got thrown out of the teacher's lounge. Um, so I, you know, I think I related to them pretty well. So thereafter, um, many of my jobs were in sex ed because it's kind of a niche sort of thing. Once you tell people this is what you do, they're like, oh, really? So come and do this. And so that's kind of how I fell into it. 
Um, so I've done this work um, at all grade levels, um, K through 12. Um, I've done the puberty talk, the HIV talk, all that stuff. I taught at um, the University of Missouri, Kansas City, the college course in sexuality. And um, anyway, while I was doing all of that, I had young children. And so I should say I'm a city of city schools of Decatur parent. Um, I have one child who graduated in May. He's now happily at Emory um, down the street. And I do have a 10th grade daughter. So my son is in college, my daughter is still. Um, in high school, so um, so I have teenagers, and but when they were younger, I would be on the playground, and people would ask me what I did, and I would tell them, and so then that leads to all kinds of conversations. So that's how this came up. They're like, "What should I be telling my child? When should I be telling them?" You know, and I would say, "Oh, um, well, my first um, answer is always, you start if you if you have the opportunity and you know enough, you start from the moment they're born." telling them the correct names for their body parts. So they feel comfortable saying penis, vagina, vulva, breasts, all those things. Because um, if they go to the doctor and they say, you know, my hoo-hoo or my cha-cha hurts, then that's a little bit, I mean, it's, it's, it can be embarrassing for them. The doctor has to find out what they're talking about. You know, it just kind of gives them a little bit more agency. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the questions that parents ask me. Um, and give some tips and some strategies. I'm not sure if that's up there. Yes, okay, great. Here. Awesome. So um, one of the most important things I tell parents when they ask me is to, when, when kids come to you as often, you're not prepared for these types of questions. And so you could just be riding in the car or doing the dishes and suddenly they're like, what's oral sex, mom? Or, you know, just something that's really, you're not prepared for. So I always say ask a clarifying question. I think uh, Dr. Jackson gave a good example. You can run to the bathroom or you can say, gosh, we didn't talk about that in my day. You know, these kind of things. Um, I say, why do you ask? And that sounds formal. You can say it any way you want, but it's kind of a clarifying question. So you find out kind of the context of why your kid is asking this question. And it also gives you a pause and a moment to like freak out in your head and be like, oh my God, why are they asking this question? And, um, and you can sort of um, figure out what you're gonna say at that point. Um, so I always say that to clarify. Um, and the main thing too is don't freak out. Because if you're the freak out parent, they're never gonna come to you because they know you're gonna freak out. So I call, my, my husband and I are a little bit different. He's less freak out parent than he used to be, but he's the freak out parent. I'm the calm parent, and both of us, uh, we try to work together. <laughs> but often, you know, my kids come to me um, when they wanna ask a question. Um, because if, if they learn that you freak out, they, they will not come to you. Um, and you want them to. Um, also, in the last couple of things, answer the question that's been asked. Don't elaborate. So for example, what's a period? The moon cycle, the, you know what I'm saying? So you kind of get into a whole, if you, if you elaborate on that question, then you end up in a whole different place than you want it to be. So you could say, um, they say, what's a period? You say, you know, why are you asking? Well, so-and-so said on the bus that this is, and then you're like, oh, and so then you can answer. Um, and the really um, important part about answering those questions and what I say is that you should practice ahead of time. So before your kid ever comes to you asking what's a period, you know, read something about it so you know what you're going to say, and then maybe talk to your child's other parent, your partner, whoever is around your child so you can kind of get some um, consensus on what your answer is going to be. And so then when they ask you, you know what you're going to say already. So you're like, oh, yes, what period is, you know, when a woman, uh, when a girl is maturing, and, you know, so you have your answer kind of down pat, and you already know what to say. Um, there was a book that I read that I really uh, enjoyed called, and it's, it's a pretty academic read, I think it was someone's uh, dissertation. It's called Not Under My Roof, and it is a sociologist who I think was maybe at Michigan State University, but she grew up in the Netherlands, and she's American, and when she came back to the U.S. as a young adult, she found that there were pregnant teenagers, and she was like, what is going on here? I don't understand why this is happening. Um, because in the Netherlands, certainly teenagers were having sex, but nobody was getting pregnant, and people were not getting sexually transmitted diseases. Um, and that's because it's just, they're more open with sex education in that society. Um, and the thing I took away from this book is that Americans tend to behave <coughs> as though there is no way to prevent pregnancy, and there is no way to prevent uh, the transmission of diseases through sex. And there is. We all know that there is, but we behave as though it's not. And we behave as though uh, becoming pregnant or getting a disease is a punishment for having sex. So if we have a child who's pregnant, well, we shouldn't have done that. 
And so it's just this different way of thinking about sexuality um, for our kids. And, um, you know, in the Netherlands, they sometimes have sleepovers, and that may not be how your family rolls. It's not how we roll. But I can certainly be a little bit more open with my kids about the methods to prevent pregnancy, the methods to prevent sexual disease transmission. And I have a whole bunch. I could just sit up here and talk all day. But there's also this really interesting thing when I was teaching um, at the university, and I read this uh, this example which said, what if we treated sexually transmitted infections like we do a cold or the flu? And we say, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, I, I'm sick, don't, don't come near me. Or, I, you know, you cough into your, you, keep, you try to keep your disease away from other people and it's okay to talk about it. So, um, so we want to make sure that we do that. Um, anyway, I have, I have way more things to say that are just frightening, but I want you to <laughs> you make sure that you, you talk to your kids, you under, you, have them understand that there are these sexually transmitted infections. Most of them are curable, but some of them lead to infertility. And so these are the things that can happen when we don't talk to our kids and don't encourage them to talk to their doctors. So, so now we've gotten to the question and answer portion of the evening. So I'll start with the questions we have here. And if additional questions come to you, feel free to just chime in after that. So um, the first question, I bet all three of you would have answers for this one, so I'll just read it and, and we can take turns uh, responding. What are some strategies or suggestions on how to keep conversations about sex recurring and casual, so not a one-time thing? That's a great question. I mean, really, this is not one talk. It's a hundred million small little conversations that start when your child, you know, starts talking and asking questions. I mean, it needs, you know, so if you're an askable parent, you're, you're ready to respond in whatever developmental level your child, you know, is the appropriate answer. Um, so it's not, it's not one talk. It's not, you know, it starts when they're very young with you being um, not freaking out, you know, with you being open and um, just answering their question. I think it's a combination of some formal times, maybe like that letter in times. But I think there are also, I'm going to, put this, I'm going to reframe this. Aren't we very fortunate to live in a society in which sex and sexuality is nonstop and always coming up? It's on every commercial, it's on every TV show. It's not as if the subject is never there. It's that we have trained ourselves not to think about that with children. But they are thinking about it. So there are a number of times that it can come up, and it's just it's a normal part of the conversation um, to develop rather than making it. I would also say that um, when it comes to sex or some others, sometimes I, it's easier to frame it as, how do I treat it when it comes to any other thing I want to teach my child? Good nutrition. Okay. How do I bring up good nutrition? Or how do I bring up, you know, they only mention it once a year, now we're going to eat broccoli and I will forget about it. Or is it a constant, just a part of the conversation? There, and some parents are doing it. I had a conversation with a senior at one point, um, having sex, and in the conversation, you know, I say, you know, it's my job. I got to ask, why are you using protection? Oh, my mother went through that in detail. She told me this, this, and I go, wow, your mother needs to come teach our courses. She was amazing. So our parents who are bringing this up as part of the conversation, it's not as if no one is. I think the other point to, that you said is that, you know, if you want to talk about your own value system or what you believe, you know, talking about uh, in a movie or a TV show something that you find offensive or you think this is a, you know, a, a stereotype or any, you know, responding, you know, what do you think about that? What do you think about the way that, that you know, girl is being portrayed or whatever? Get a conversation started based on, and, and occasionally watch their TV shows, <laughs> even though you don't want to. Watch Riverdale. That's what I was going to say. Okay, I realize all the high school students are 25 to 29 at that school, <laughs> but that's what they're watching, and those are the conversations. Yeah. And the music they're listening to. Because I mean, that becomes a a, a vehicle. Mm -hmm. 
and interesting about Riverdale because all those they are all adults and they're having some really active sex lives <laughs> on that show. It's really and so I started watching it with my kids and eventually I asked them so many questions that they got tired they don't watch it anymore. They're just like, oh that's a stupid show. We know they're not teenagers, mom. I'm like, so, I know see. one mom made herself, and she didn't like doing this, listen to her child's music in the car. Yeah. Like, let's all listen to it. You get to pick. And there were some lyrics, and she was trying to be polite. These are very profound lyrics. <laughs> wow. They're very sexual. But that, she said, became a conversation of, what is he talking about doing to her? And let's have that spring it up. Because it was there, rather than pretending it wasn't. What do you tell kids and at what age? So um, what can they process without overwhelming or scaring them? I have a personal story about that. And I have to be careful because like my my child's counselor is here, my teacher is <laughs> like, I won't, I won't talk too much about them. But um, when I was young, I think one of the reasons why I do this work is because my parents were those hippie parents that told us everything when we were three. And so then we went to the playground and told everyone else. And, um, and I grew up and I was upset that they had told me all of that when I was, and I just thought that was wrong and I would never do that. And I would wait until they were, and I didn't even know what would be the right age, but I just thought I would know. Um, so everything was fine with my son, but then my daughter, um, so right around when she started to go through puberty, I was like, okay, let me just, let, we'll sit down and have this conversation. We've had some conversations before, but let's talk about the mechanics of sex and stuff like that. I realized in that moment, as I was talking to her, she was embarrassed. Because she had already gone through this transition, her body had already changed. She was she was deep into puberty at that point. She hadn't started her period yet. But um, then I realized, you know, there's a wisdom really in just telling kids when they're five years old the mechanics of sex because they're not embarrassed. They're just like, oh, okay. And then they run off and go play. So I realized, you know, that I, I had to. Tell, I went and told my mom. I said, all this time I've been mad at you, but you did that properly. I thought that was. That's what I so anyway, I, I think that. Younger is better, um, in, in my opinion. And you know, just to answer the question, if they mm -hmm. say, where yeah. do babies come from, and they're like four, mm -hmm. you know, they don't really want a big, whole, long, drawn out thing. They just want, you know, an answer, and then they're like, okay, whatever, bye, bye, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, let them lead the conversation. You know, if they ask a follow-up question, you know, just try to answer as honestly as you can. And if you don't know, say, I don't know. Um, it's, it's not easy. But there's a lot of good resources for ages of when you, you might want to bring up stuff if your child doesn't bring it up. Um, so one of our parents wants help with establishing rules regarding supervision for a time with boyfriend or girlfriend. And then also information about approaching the subject of porn with a nine-year-old. Or we'll do the first one, then do the second. Rather okay. mix them together, mix and match. Um, I'll start with the first one about the subject of rules and guidelines and everything. Well, I think first is to decide, remember I said, what you believe. And if they're a family, what well, everybody in the family <laughs> believes, mom and mom, mom and dad, dad and dad, so we're all on the same page. We're not disagreeing. I think that's going to be very important. And then I think the why is also very important. But I've also told parents that um, it's quite comfortable to say, like, why can't I have my door closed? You know, can, can, don't you trust me? And um, well, the answer is, well, no. <laughs> no <it's okay. laughs> uh, but you can always go back to, it's all your fault. He says, maybe I don't, but I just have this issue I'm working on that I'm just uncomfortable with the door closed. I'll go to my therapist and work on that, but until I get it fixed, we need to leave the door open because I'm having a problem with it. And it's true, you know. Why am I going to stay up until 11 o'clock when you get in? I'll be sitting there because I can't go to sleep until you do. It's my issue. I'm going to go out. I'll grow up when you're 80, but until then. So I think part of that is hitting that balance. But also, that being said, I also want to remind folks that we don't want to go to the rule, 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 graduate, leave that college 100% on their own. That is scary. So I think the thing is to always remember is I'm raising a future adult who will have the ability to make decisions. You know, how many of you have um, high school students? 
Okay, so they're going to be on their own in one, two, or three years, 100% making all their sexual decisions. <laughs> and this is, this is where every parent quits smiling, they all go, okay. But if we always keep the goal in mind, that may help us to figure out how am I going to get these degrees balanced with what I'm comfortable with as an adult. And, you know, it's my stuff too. That's why you can't stay out till 3 in the morning, even when you come home from college, because mama can't sleep when you're out that long. So I'll start that. Y'all can add to that about the rules. I mean, I think that's just an individual parent-family decision. And, uh, you know, the only factor that I would say in there is that there's another person involved who you have to think about his or her, the partner of this kid. What does that family believe? And uh, so it's not, it's not simply your own rules. It's, you know, making sure all the kids are safe and following their family rules too, so. But it's okay to have rules. I think rules are good. But there has to be some flexibility, I think. Because I think also whatever you can do to help your child feel like they're participating in that conversation, they're going to follow that rule a lot better. Even if they totally that. disagree with the sure. reason you get to sure. is you were a part of that and this is where we, we are now. The, the second question I think dealt with porn at that age or any age. And I'm definitely not going to give a quick answer, but I would say it's there. They can all access it if your child has a smartphone, period. It's not back in the day when you had to sneak way into the grocery store and smuggle the magazine out and you were looking at a very dirty Time magazine. Okay, I mean, that was, you know, it's different now. And so part of it, and with all the cyber, is teaching them the what's and why's and how's. Okay, um, I am a believer that... Um, a, we're aiming for adults to head into the world, but also telling them that the phone that you have in your house is your business phone. Okay, and just like you know, at my business, I just can't look up anything I want to because the school owns the computer and the airwaves and all of that. I just want you to be aware that it's a business phone, and so setting those cyber security functions on there and having those conversations with your child about those, I think, are very important. What I think with porn, it's very important to discuss that why don't I want you to look at porn, okay? And let's talk about addiction. Let's talk about false stereotypes. Let's talk about desensitization. Let's talk about all that, because that's also important. So I know you're drawn to it because you're a living, breathing human being, but I think the why is also important along with those rules. I've opened up the conversation. The experts will now answer <laughs> well, the thing is that they, they're, they're going there because they want the information. And they want the information because they're not getting it from uh, reliable sources. So, uh, and they're going to porn. I think this could be an entire talk, so I don't think we want to get go down the porn. Um, you know, we're going to go down the porn garden lane and then never come back. Um, One thing we have talked about, folks, is, and we're already talking with men stopping violence, to have them come in and do a presentation just on pornography at our young, at our young people. Yeah. I think having some literacy about what they're watching and, uh, and understanding that these, you know, these people are not, you know, they're Photoshop, these are not, you know, um, I mean, all of the, the information to, you know, there's no communication, there's no, these are not normal bodies, this, you know, all, all of that sort of thing. And I think when you discover with your child, because I've had numerous parents call me, okay, we found this, this was going on, what do we do, is contain your reaction for the first 24 hours, think about it, and then come back and have the conversation. It doesn't mean your child is destined to be a deviant and never going to be seen again but they need to have that longer term conversation about what it means. Because it's a, it's a freaky thing when parents see that with their child. And while I'm talking legal, just for fun, please remind your, your children that though they're 16 and can, they may have consent, sending a picture of naked person to their naked boyfriend or girlfriend is child pornography. And it is, if it's on that phone, even if it's by consent, they don't reshare it. You know, there's all breakup sex and anything like that. Don't talk about that. 
one non-minor sending it to another non-minor, they're both technically participating in child pornography and they may not realize that because they wouldn't realize that. I'm not a child. Why would I think that? I bet a lot of us didn't know that. If it's just on their phone, by consent, not resharing, just there. And I've had a kid where somebody else shared it from their phone. Mm -hmm. You know, they just picked up their cousin's phone and shared it with everybody. And it's and distributing it, child. And it, beca mm -hmm. it became, uh, years ago, it became a disaster. Yeah. Like That's that. not even mentioning people who misuse it once they break up and all those kinds yeah. of things. That's a whole new cyberbullying issue. And it also can become a school discipline issue. Mm -hmm. They're sharing those pictures in the school setting. So. Or if it becomes a conversation, if it was shared at home, but it's a conversation the next day in school, it's now a school issue. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you, there ain't no just way indicator. If anything happens not in the building, it doesn't eventually make its way into a conversation in the building. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say about pornography real quickly is you could also ask your child, you know, what are you, once you've taken a break for 24 hours yeah. and kind of stop freaking out, you know, what are they trying, you know, why, what were you looking for? Like, what is it you wanted? Um, you were trying to find out if there's a whole bunch of pictures of breasts on your on your child's phone. Say, you know, what are you, you know, what are you trying to find out here? There's different sizes, different shapes, you know, just and then you can get some context for kind of what they're doing, and then the conversation can become a bigger conversation about this is acting, this is not the way that sex is, these are not the kinds of relationships that we want you to pursue, you know, that kind of thing. So And I'd also say that in some of these, it's okay to outsource. Um, I know I've had conversations with family friends in which they, um, the 15-year-old was having sex and they wanted, we were the uncle of you know, good friends, they said, would you have the conversation with him? So you may have a good family member, a pediatrician, a, someone in the faith community that they're really close to that can also have those conversations, not as if we have to know everything. I trust you, would you have this conversation with her about this? That's one of my big tips too, is make sure that you have an adult that you trust who may not share necessarily all your ideas, but, but they know what they are and they can talk to your child about these issues too because you want somebody else that they can talk to. So if they don't have somebody like that, try to figure out who that might be. Because I could take any two random yeah. and your kids and you're pretty ignorant, but if I swapped kids yeah. and you're talking to the other person, you're like this wise person right. who knows stuff. <laughs> And if you're ignorant now, you'll be wise when your child turns somewhere between 21 and 25, you'll gain wisdom. But sometimes, because, you know, really my job, a lot of parents say, I told the same thing, and I go, but you don't know anything, you're a parent. I'm trying to help my junior nephew learn about college. I am so eager when it comes to knowing about college. Okay. With anyone else, I know stuff. So familiarity, because of the great love for that person, means they're less likely to maybe want to listen to to that part of stuff. Okay, the next question is, do you think sexual health education should be addressed in high school and not only middle school? <clears throat> I think it should be throughout, um, it should be K-12. That's called comprehensive sex education and it is in very few places in the United States. Um, it can be a part of any curriculum. Unfortunately now teachers and count they have to field these questions and they're unprepared. If we have if we had comprehensive sex education then our kids would have much more information, the parents would have more information, the teachers wouldn't be um, overburdened with with questions that come out of left field. You know, so um, it should be it should be everywhere. But it's very hard because the loudest voices dictate what's going to happen. Um, and unfortunately people who may want that in their school or think that their school's right. We stay home when it's time to vote or it's time to go lobby. That's how this stuff changes. It's the government that's determining what your kids are learning. And I, I haven't been in five school systems, okay, because I'm really old. Um, we do a, we do a really poor job of sex education. Um, we don't cover gay, lesbian, bisexual, students with disabilities. Um, that it's a different conversation with your five, 10, 15, 18 heading out to the world. Some of you may have been, I've done once with parents, I haven't done it in a few years, but it was um, how to talk to your adult child about sex. We have it in March or April of senior year, and parents and students come together and we talk about sex in a big room together. 
but I used nachos one year as my example. I said, it's like, we all think nachos are great, but sometimes we know we're going to regret having nachos the night before. Even though we're craving the nachos, we know, and we know if we want to try to avoid nachos, we don't hang out in a Mexican restaurant because we're going to have nachos. A girl came to me the next day, a senior goes, thank you, you've not ruined nachos for my entire family. Okay. So, but to answer it, I think we need to have it across the, um, the board in a more, you know, because there are different conversations that they, they need to have. Are you going to have that this year? I, right now my capacity is a little bit low to be able to do those things. I do love to have them because I can say very blunt, open things and then I let parents talk to each other and mm -hmm. students talk to each other and it's really a, you know, it's a, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Because the whole concept is they're handing off into the world in six months what do you want them to know and why and how are you going to do it, which is very different than how do I begin the conversation is how do I begin the conversation about sex with my adult child? So it's a very different maturity development level than I would say with my 10th grade families. It's just senior families. I'll look at it again. I love to do it. It's how to transition to being that adult parent, child, friend thing. And I bring in experts who are living it and have them come in and talk about that. Um, I guess I want to chime in on that question too since um, I'm a school person. Uh, we are looking at um, our curriculum right now and evaluating it and looking at ways um, we can make sure that kids have opportunities to have this education in high school as well. And there are opportunities because there's biology, there's um, psychology, there are different that. courses, but um, students have to elect to be in those courses, so it's not something that's available for all students. So um, this year we are evaluating what has been offered and looking at how we can expand that. Right. And I just, with that, one of the things we've done in the high school the past two or three years with mental health is every teacher committed to teach one mental health um, unit within their lesson. And I know it was done in Scarlet Letter to talk about bullying, and it was done in you know, different places. Um, but we found out by embedding it in the curriculum, it became authentic to the students. Um, one student at the end of the year goes, I didn't have any mental health lessons, but he had had seven. <laughs> but it seemed that it was just a natural part of to look at health statistics in math class, to look at physics when cars go boom and crash, you know, F equals MA, whatever that stuff is. But if you're drinking, how you're a few seconds slower and how that increases the boom. And how do you stop a friend from doing that? So we found by embedding those lessons in there, it was much more authentic and meant something. Sort of like exactly what Dr. Hulse is talking about, rather than now we're going to stop and talk about sex, and now let's continue real life, rather than it's a part of the experience. Do, do, there is a rumor mm -hmm. that there are just condoms given out everywhere at the high school. Do we supply condoms at the high school? I don't know <laughs> that they're given out. I, I'm unaware of that. Like there's not a fishbowl somewhere. Like, okay. We, like, yeah, there's this Like you're going to your typical adult bar and there's a yeah. bowl of condoms yeah. there. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there could be. <laughs> In my 12 years, I've never encountered one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I want to get lost a lot, so I'm going to go a lot of strange places in the building. So. I will say that here in Georgia, um, it's actually against the law for schools to provide contraception. Mm -hmm. That is a state law. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? So when we're talking about, like, that was my question, actually, about the high school level. Because exactly like what you were saying, it's kind of a conversation throughout because of developmental and maturity. And, and then what comes back, HIV is coming back up, and these kids haven't had that, you know, education because it was under the radar for quite some time. But what are resources within the community? So if we're not just saying it's the school, it's the school, what are resources where um, we can support families? Like if I'm a family and I maybe want assistance or I want my child to go take a sex education type of class or curriculum, do you know what's available outside Well, I do know, and Decatur is unique in that um, I know some of our faith communities here in, in Decatur have offered some very extensive and supportive comprehensive sex education programs as part of their communities. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. That 
we, we pulled from some of them before. Mm -hmm. um, so I know those. I'm less aware of what may be offered to you through the Y or some different places like that. I do know with condoms, you know, there's, there's a bit of an equity issue in that, in that some students with minimal means can easily get a condom into the CVS. Mm -hmm. okay? But if you have less economic means, then it becomes more of a challenge. Then. So we're talking some social justice kinds of things based on who can and cannot get access. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, I'm totally unaware of it in the school. I mean, mm -hmm. friend to friend, perhaps, I'm yeah. sure. But I'm unaware that any of the school has done that. But it does raise a bigger concern about how we provide that kind of support for or how students can access it through know, the housing authority, the Y, the I know where you know, to go. Yeah. You know, I don't know. The other thing is, um, it's not just the contraception, it's the, um, you know, preventing disease, you know, preventing the spread of disease. So, you know, that's a two pronged kind of thing, you know? It also is con contraception, but aren't we wanting not to spread disease? One mother said, basically, was very blunt, in one of those meetings, she says, I do not want you to have sex. I do not think that is important. Uh, I think it's important that you not have sex, but even more, I do not want you to die. Mm -hmm. And she had that conversation mm -hmm. about that. So parents can say those things in meetings. I sit there and nod, and I can let them say it. Mm -hmm. When my son was, I guess, 15 or 16, he asked me as I was driving the car, Mom, how do I know if I've got the condom on right? And I almost drove off the road, <laughs> and I said, I'm not having this conversation, Emma. And I said to him, I'm not having this conversation, Emma, but I will treat you like one of the kids I work with. So what do you want to know? And they do have instructions in those things. But one of the agreements we came upon then was that if he ever needed a supply, and he wasn't comfortable asking me, that he could always come to me and say, Mom, I need 20 bucks. And that that was our code that Mama need 20 bucks. He never abused it, but for him, that was his code to Mom, I need some condoms. And did I really want to buy my 16-year-old son condoms? Not really. But on the other hand, did I really want my son to be bringing me home a baby or bringing some illness home and spreading an illness? So we had, we had a code. Um, and I, I'm blessed to have the means to be able to do that. Um, you know, I, there'd be something I could go without real quickly. So we had a code about buying the condoms of where to get them. And I had a basket in their bathroom that was filled with condoms. And, you know, I don't care how off, who uses them. I don't care how, how quickly they disappear. But please let me know when the supply is getting low. I wanted to say two things. One about the spreading of disease. Um, so when I was in Kansas City, Missouri, there was an HIV program, and they actually did um, testing, STD testing in the high schools. It was very unusual, and it doesn't happen very often. But um, And I only say this just sort of so you can think about it. They, their statistic was 10% of those kids in high school were born, had undiagnosed chlamydia, and they didn't know it. And chlamydia causes infertility. So it is easily preventable, easily treatable, and um, so I just want you to think about that as parents. Um, and the second thing I wanted to say was that I think maybe one of the curriculum you're talking about is the OWL, the OWL Whole Lives curriculum, which is offered by the Unitarians and the United Church of Christ. And usually it's secular, and they do the religious, there's a religious component that they do with their um, community. but. Um, it's a very comprehensive program. It starts with kindergarten, and they have it goes all the way to senior citizen. So they talk about people in their sexual lives. You can go and participate. It's usually six to eight weeks, um, and you go once a week. Um, it's a very good curriculum, um, and so if you have any interest in that, um, I can certainly uh, tell you how to find it on the internet. You just go to your local Unitarian or United Church of Christ and ask, and they do allow people to come in from the community. Or we can also um, if there's enough interest, you can get people to do one off-site. Because DP, the parent network has looked at trying to get the city to offer them, mm -hmm. um, but they were kind of like, well, that's the school's responsibility. Yeah. You know, everybody was kind of going, eh. um, But we were looking at trying mm -hmm. to see if there were enough people in this community who really wanted that 
to make, because the Unitarian Church is a, is a hike away, uh, and not everybody is willing to go to something that's church affiliated, even if it's very secular. And so, if you're interested in that program, let us know. Can I, can I have a question? Um, I'm a parent with younger children, fourth and sixth grade, so I'm not as familiar as where the education continues with this at, in, at the school level, you know, where we're at with the fourth grade, it's still, you know, safe touch, and is there a place that, what does the curriculum go to as they get older in middle school and the high school, what is taught, what is not taught, is there a place that we can find that out? I know they'll send them a letter when they, they cover something, usually do they continue to do that in the system, I'm just curious. Yes, um, so the school district works in partnership with parents and that's part of the reason you received the letter. Um, consistent with Georgia law, you have the, the right to opt out when these conversations are happening. So um, when the conversation happens in fifth grade, um, you have that option. And then in terms of what happens with health, you can refer to like the Georgia standards and you'll see the health uh, curriculum that's there and that that would give you information and that's available online in terms of what's taught there. And that would also be the case for the official courses that students sign up for, biology, psychology, and other things that might cover aspects of sex education. But there's not a specific, I mean, they don't go in, is, I'm, I'm curious, do they go into the details with the students? I mean, I remember going back to when I was in middle school and there was straight up sex education in the classroom. The girls went in one room. The boys want me out of the room and they said, this is how it works. They have people come in. Class. I mean, okay, yeah, I mean, this, was, this was middle school, so I'm just kind of curious. Is that I can't speak to the fifth grade, but I go into all the eighth grade classes once a week for a program under DPI and teach into the eighth grade classes. I started with class Health classes. Health classes, thank you. Um, and I know they spend at the end of the connections, which is what, like 13 or 14 weeks, um, they told me they spend about a week. Like, how in-depth do they go? I don't know. And quite honestly, um, health kind of changed with staffing and so forth this year, so it's kind of a good time probably to like really look ahead. Um, but um, what I can say is I know that there's one teacher who just give me a question, I'll give you the answer. Give me a question, I'll give you the answer. And then there's probably another teacher that they aren't getting all of the information or maybe kids aren't comfortable or the teacher's not comfortable. And so forth and so on. They're definitely getting something, but um, you know, I just don't know if it's consistent across the classes from what you know I've seen. Uh, health classes. Yeah, so all eighth graders eighth grade. get health class, um, and it actually goes on their high school diploma, right? It's like the college class, um, and that's why I I'm the one asking the question about in high school um, because I really think if we want to be successful, you know, raising our kids, they, there needs to be more help across right. to everyone in high school at some point. Like, yeah, no, I, um, I was just thinking about the Our Whole Lives curriculum, like I tried to access it, um, and so the Unitarian Church is a hike away, um, but both of the other, the United Church of Christ Church, like they have a group that's kind of formed, and so they weren't. Like, so there, there wasn't a place for my kid right now. And then the ages were off, so I am definitely interested. Okay. Um. Yeah, so this, it's in line with this. My, my son, older son, is going to high school in the fall. And so he, he, he's not yet at the stage where he brings female friends home. Um, but as they start getting to that stage, this is a question of consent. And it is one obligated to inform the other, the parent of the female that, hey, your child comes to, my, to see my son. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of consent, <laughs> right? And wondering how that is navigated as the children get to that age. If a male child brings a female child home, I'm not saying anything is happening there, there. Do I need to inform the parent of that female child that, hey, your child is in my home, is it okay, do you want this? I don't know what it is. Does anybody have any thoughts? It's, it's an open question. I'm just I'm intrigued. Well, I think legally, I mean, obviously as parents, if minors are in our home and something happens, there is some responsibility whether we knew it, what was going on or not. Mm -hmm. 
And so it goes back, I think, to what you all are saying. It's like these conversations, we as a family, this, these are our expectations and so forth and so on. And maybe make it more of a less than a female's ear hole, but then you type another child's ear hole. Yeah. Do your folks know here? Yeah. Um, and more of a idea of one family. It's not more consent, it's more family. That's why I like these meetings, more family agreement between each other. You know, the old Mayberry, I know where my kid is, you know, you know where your kid is, may be a way of, of doing that. And I mean, that's the, the same thing for, like, you know, alcohol consumption, you know. It's not just sex, it could be about guns, for that matter, you know. I mean, you're wanting to keep your child safe, so I, I don't know. I mean, I'm a little bit removed from this. I, I didn't, you know, my kids are older, but... Um, I think it's nice just to reach out to the parents of the kids who are coming to your house. It's a little harder when they get to high school, and I have definitely been the, the more, um, I don't know if they're calling me a helicopter parent, but I've definitely been more involved with my daughter's group of friends and trying to make sure that I know who all the parents are and that we have phone numbers. Because one thing that troubles me is my daughter goes to her friend's house, she has her phone, that other kid has her phone, but none of the parents know how to reach each other. So if there's an emergency, they don't even know who I am or how to reach me. And so I try to try to do that just as a courtesy. And maybe if you open up that conversation just like with a hello, then if something else happens That's, later down the line. And this is why you need yeah. to be on the parent network. And we need to get as many parents on there as possible and activate your account and make sure you update your account so that I have your number and you have mine. Um, I mean, it won't cover all the parents, but it sure is a start. And that's one thing we've really been encouraging parents is if you say they're hanging out with John and you don't really know John, reaching out to the parents, at least you've got their phone number because you're more likely to answer the phone than the kid is. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I think what you said was um, more in the sense of less than I'm monitoring you as a big brother, it's how can we be a good community? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just need to know your mom is in case you should ever break a leg, what are we going to do? Or can I call your mom and ask if you can just have dinner with us tonight? You know, to reach out and there's that more natural way of, you know, we know you're there, they know you're there. Um, it's getting dark. Should I call your mom and tell her I'll bring you home later and see if you can stay a little bit longer? <laughs> just to naturally build those bridges rather than more of an alarm. Uh, when my 17-year-old daughter talks about sex, it sounds very depersonalized or transactional. I'm looking for ideas about how to talk with her about the relational aspects of sex. Things like how to communicate with potential sexual partners in a way that is respectful of herself and the other person. Yeah, this is a great question, and this is not anything that any student is getting in any kind of health class. Uh, how to how to communicate about sex or what's a, what what feels good or talking about pleasure or you know um, consent um, and so I you know I I think it's hard you can start a conversation talking about what what is it that you know it, it, with a friend you know what are the characteristics that you you know, that are important in a friendship, you know, honesty, trust, you know, all those sorts of things. And um, I, I think they're, this, this is the important thing, is to get them to develop relationships that, where they can communicate, learning how to communicate. Um, and, you know, porn is, shows you how not to do it, you know, how no one talks to each other, no one, and I, I can tell you that if kids learn how to talk about sex with each other, they're less likely to do it, actually. One thing I learned from watching the show Glee a long time ago, I watched it like the first three or four seasons, and it was it was helpful to me because I was teaching at the university, so I'd show clips of it all the time. So they were oh, always story, talking yeah, about, yeah, they're yeah. always talking about everything those kids are talking about. And there's this one clip that I love, which is when Kurt, who's gay, and his dad has to have a sex talk with him, and he gets some pamphlets, and he's like, yeah, it's going to, what does he say? He's like, yeah, we're going to talk about it, sit down, and Kurt is like, no, and he goes, yeah, it's going to suck for both of us. And he goes, <laughs> but, but, and I thought that was really funny. But he has a beautiful conversation with him, and in the end he says, you know, you're a special person. You don't want to just throw yourself around. He goes, you know, sex is a way to connect with another person. 
and use it in that way. Don't use it in a transactional way. Use it as a way to connect. And I've definitely talked to my kids about that. But this is a, this is a special thing you can share with someone. It's not just an act, you know, at least not the way that we think about it. And I think at any age, particularly mm -hmm. at that age, there's sometimes a difficulty in doing future thinking. Like, yes, you can have sex on Friday night. What are you going to feel like and think about on Monday when you're at school together? Or when he starts dating someone else? Or what are the things, because one of the, I was running a group once, a counseling group, and I found the most interesting was a senior and a 10th grader, and somehow they were talking about having sex, and the senior did a lecture that I never could have done, because I did, and it was a mistake, because we were never friends again. And I really wish I had done it differently. And you know, and if I had said that, that would have been nothing. But the idea, think ahead to what it may be, rather than just approach it. Because the mind is geared, it's like, you know, I want to eat the nachos, not that I'm going to have heartburn afterwards or there's some effects. And having them have those conversations can sometimes lead to those. And I've had conversations with two people may go in for a transaction. It's just going to be fun. It's just going to be physical. But maybe. But there's also what if someone could develop feelings? Or what if there's feelings that you don't know about? Or what if those feelings afterwards? Because we're not really able to separate those things out. And let's have that kind of conversation. Just if you have a conversation with separate from sex, how do you talk to your children about at some point? Who do you know if it's someone's worth dating and treat you right? Separate from your sex, or if they're a good person, or what you're going to want in a relationship. And sex happens just being part of that rather than it's sex and relationships as two separate conversations. And also that women, I know one with my daughter was just saying over and over again, now remember, women tend to, once that orgasm happens and the hormones are released, you tend to imprint and bond with that person. Is that somebody you really want to bond with? Do you really want to bond with that person? That's something to think about before you have the act. But whichever person asked that question, the fact that you're asking that and thinking about that is really wonderful. Yeah, because that's what the kids are really wanting to, to know. That's what they're really asking. Yes. Without asking. Yeah. They ask it in private sessions, but they don't always ask it among themselves. And they're not getting good role models. If what they're looking at is porn or they're, you know, or the media, you know, they're not getting good role models at all. But on the flip side, don't like is it such a bad thing? So it seems that a lot of people got into destructive relationships because of the emotional aspect, right? It may have started as a sexual relationship and an emotional aspect, and it becomes a destructive relationship. So, you know, I don't know if there's a balance. Because in my mind, there's got to be a balance that we don't train our children to say this is, you know, I, I grew up in a culture, the first person you have sex with is the person you marry. Right? It's such a great, you, know, you must marry this person and it becomes a lawyer. It, uh, goes up. That's an interesting. Yes. And we as adults haven't fully figured it out, but at least we can start the conversation. In one of the trainings um, we talked about in the 1800s, you basically hit puberty. 13 or 14 or married at 13 or 14. So the gap between puberty and marriage was a month, I mean a year. Okay, And now we know that because of good health, people are hitting puberty, let's say 10 to 12 or 13. Okay, And they're getting married 26 to 32. So what are you going to do with that as opposed to that? And that is a conversation to begin having. Okay, his family. And I think the other thing is with cell phones and texting, people people don't really know how to talk to each other anymore anyway, you know? That's a, considered a conversation is a text that, you know, I, I just, I think there, that, that could be a really big conversation. I'm going 
concerned with how my daughter, who would never use disparaging words referring to race or sexual orientation, frequently uses the B word. Um, I'm concerned how women and sex are portrayed in some of the music she listens to. I'm a father and I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Males, my, I heard my sorry, just say, I heard my son saying some lyrics the other day, and you know better than that. Maybe the music is bad. I'm not sure I heard what the question was. I think it's just a concern. But, your thoughts um, on it? I don't know what they're listening to, so I can't comment. I think it's another opportunity for conversation again, because um, definitely my. I mean, you know, and so it's just, it's an opportunity for conversation to give my husband, who's the freak out here, and it's like, why are they using this language? And I'm just like, okay, let's calm down and figure out kind of what does this mean? And I think, you know, to them, they say that, you know, that it doesn't mean what it means to us. It's just whatever, you know? And I, I doubt that, you know, because eventually it, 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 it has its own meanings. So it's another opportunity for conversation. And I mean, one opportunity is to simply Google the lyrics and print them out and then sit and have a conversation where you're looking at the lyrics rather than listening to them that can have a different kind of effect. But I also have conversations um, about in-group comments that are negative. Black people using the N-word themselves, gay people using fag to refer to each other. And we talk about, I've had with gay students talk about Okay, yes, it can be just fun, it doesn't, but is it also a way that you're actually having some internalized homophobia there where you're actually saying bad things about yourself and maybe it's affecting you, you don't realize that. Is it having some negative effect that you're not really aware of? But even worse, what if your buddy next to you is hearing that, even though it doesn't affect you, and start thinking about the people around you who it may be affecting, even if you're in that group and using that word, is it... Maybe reinforcing some images on you, or is it affecting some of the other people? And I would say the same with, with using the B word for women. Is it reinforcing, or is it reinforcing to every guy that hears it, even though you as a woman maybe don't have that perception, does the guy perhaps, and just begin that kind of dialogue with them? It's shocking that I've just started singing the words along. And they were so shocked to hear those words coming out of my mouth that it put a whole different spin on it. I think sometimes young women, too, by using the B word, they think that they're taking back their power. You know, and I think that's a lot with these kind of words. People think they can kind of change them and make them mean something different. Um, but, um, so I think some of it is that, and then that leads me down a deep hole with this kind of new feminism that I don't appreciate. Um, with the Kardashians and whatever, showing everything, showing your whole body is like body positivity and all these kind of things. So these are all things that um, that all parents, I think, are wrestling with and trying to figure out how to address that. I will say one thing that I, in one of my more lucid parenting moments, when, <laughs> um, they're talking about body positivity and like Kim Kardashian and there's someone else who was on like, Dancing with the Stars and people were like, this is body positivity because they had their bikinis on. And I told my daughter, I said, this is not. They have traditional bodies that are, you know, people like these kind of bodies. These are the ones that people are trying for. This isn't body positivity. This just is narcissism. And so in <laughs> exhibitionism, I was like, you know, where's the 300-pound yoga teacher doing I'm making that into a bumper sticker. That's that cool. is body positivity. I was like, let's find her. And we did. I was like, this is body positivity. That is not. That's just exhibitionism and narcissism. So, you know, let's talk about what feminism really means because what they're doing is not feminism. So, but again, you're circling back to where we started, yeah. which is the establishing the capital to have conversations. Yes, that's and true. And so that you can have these on because they're not. Yeah. Where do babies come from? Well, that's a point one, two, three, yeah. four. You know, yeah. but these are longer conversations that I think are important to keep going. And maybe you'll have them when your child's 30 and you're a little older at Thanksgiving. So that's all the questions in the basket, but we can oh, we have a few minutes. We can open the floor for other questions. Yes. So I have kids who don't ask questions. So I'm just trying to figure out, like, I, I 
I'm, I'm getting like, try to make teachable moments with lots of different things, but I do feel like I need to like, I don't know, what have a books? bigger conversation. What about books? Yes. Okay, so are these, these some are the of books? Them, okay. Some of them are, you know, I mean, you just have to look and see what is, you know, for younger children and, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just as a part of. And there may be, and there books, some books show like what they maybe want to learn or need to know at certain, but you could even as a family, we talked about the school curriculum, create a family curriculum. What do I want my child to know at five, eight, ten, and if it's not asked, then I have to find a movie, book, or something, so it is the topic of conversation that we get to those. And YouTube's wonderful. And most people don't. I mean, most people are. I should have done that three years ago, or I should have done that five years ago, rather than, so any of you have elementary kids? Yeah. Okay, great, you're the ones who can then plan it. This is what I want you to know from now to 20. Um, and then the books and the movies. And just leaving the books around, you know? You don't necessarily have to read them to the, but just have them. And it can always be blame them all, okay? I think you need to know this now so that I can sleep at night. We're gonna have this next topic of conversation. Or a, a, you know, a box on the dinner table, you know, where you pull out questions and... Um, <laughs> the box is stacked. <laughs> the deck is stacked. Uh -huh. Or a box that they know anytime they can put a question in and once in a while you go to it. You see? Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add, and Susan, you can probably talk more about this. I learned, we were talking with our kids in the Decatur Youth Action Team, um, their high school kids, and we got together over the holiday break. And... Um, I was going to say in Terry's style, but it's really both of us. Like, we were having, like, a good time and playing games, and they are talking about dating, and then the question was, like, okay, you're dating, and Terry starts firing away. Would you know how to store your con condoms? What should you be doing? And asking, you know, all these questions. They did not know the answers at all. And so Terry brought up, you know, female condoms, and I used to work in the HIV field in the early 90s, and I was like, I totally forgot that there's such a thing. And then I went to the Youth Summit at Agnes Scott, and they were giving away female condoms. Um, so I'm going to be known as this person who opens up female condoms. <laughs> I've been doing this recently. But I don't know. I've never used one. I don't know if anyone's able to explain what they are exactly. But y'all are the experts and not me. So <laughs> Because, I mean, like, you know, we're, when we say condoms, we're always thinking about men, right? And women can, you know, take on some um, precautions for themselves. Yeah, I mean, it's just, a, it's kind of the um, opposite of a male condom. Can you use both? Basically. I haven't Googled it. Can you use yes. a male condom and yes. a female condom at yes. the same time? It's very noisy, this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <coughs> Did you want me to open this? Whatever. If you guys want me to open it, I'll open it. What the heck? So you can, so you can see it. Don't you want to go home? I won't bring up anything else, I promise. Um, but, I mean, in all seriousness, I mean, I have a daughter and I have a son. My son's graduated from high school. I know he knows about condoms. I saw the circle in his wallet, so I know that he had it in there and probably used it. I don't know how long it was in there. And talking to him about, so how are you storing that? Yeah. <laughs> and has it expired? And are you keeping it to what? And so I do think about, like, with my daughter when it's right or when it comes up. But, so, this is it. And yeah. so... Uh, I guess this is a ring. It gets inserted, goes up against what, like the uterus? Service. Service. Thank you. Don't throw the kids. Wait, why? I have some things, but surely not bad again. But anyway, so there you go. There it is. Yeah. So y'all know. Thank you. <laughs> It's always good to have some new information or you. So I'll just leave it right here. <laughs> There's like nice you are your hands, hands you know, all over. Like, like, oh, you that. need some soft knuckles. <laughs> but I've also known women also who carry around um, male cousins. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they are, you know, are also equally insistent upon the Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Just one other thing, and it's like the social worker and data reporter stuff that sticks in my head. When you guys were talking about um, using the right names, like not the woohoo and you know all of that, um, like we know in child protective services, if kids don't have that actual accurate name, 
when they start talking when because there's kids who might be sexually abused babies first you know one years old two years old and we're not using the right names and they start talking like whether they're to their teacher and they're saying some word and we don't know what that means if they know the right word then they're going to use that word so it's really powerful to use that outside of the and that's why system. you know sexual sexuality education is really you know uh, and sexual health is really from birth to you know death basically we're all sexual people and this is a good thing this isn't this is a, a good thing for us and for our children and we want them to be sexually healthy we want them to engage in good um, satisfying sexual relationships isn't that our goal to have for our children to be able to be in a relationship where they're getting satisfying sex I mean ultimately and all of you being here tonight is far above many who simply will acknowledge that their children are sexual beings. I would challenge you all something that's we can do a challenge. I would challenge you that sometime in the next two or three days, you simply let your child know that you came to this presentation of DPN and what the topic was. As there was a crazy, crazy as, lady with as, as is appropriate to their developmental level. Okay? But that, you know, it's something we talk about. You know, this week we talked about that, this week we talked about that. It's just we did. Now go do the dishes. I mean, you know, but it just it's a part of the conversation. Okay. Just, I know. One more quick question. Um, when you have older and younger siblings in the household, um, not too far apart, obviously, you tell something to one, it's going to get passed down to the other. The younger one, you know, appropriate just to go ahead and tell both of them at that point, I would, I would think, but then the younger one is equipped with this information that you may not want them sharing with kids at that younger age, I mean, at what point, how would you work with that? I mean, is that something you say, this is something we talk about within our own household, and we don't talk about, you know. How far apart are you? Just two years apart, but six, four, so, but you know, you're all hearing on school buses in Decatur that there are fourth graders talking about sex, and so at that point you'd say, well, maybe we should just be having this conversation all around, so. I think, I mean, I have a, almost three year, two and a half year age difference between mine and 